well-being of the community. Untak Surabaya also has two business unit, fertilizer or pupuk cap jempol, and mineral water. Both are the result of research downstream in order to the independence of institutional funding. Untak Surabaya Eco Campus continuously improve the effort aligned with nature and environment, started from the nearest to the easiest way of getting things can be done by all the Civitas Academica. Fertilizer. Untak Surabaya gradually and continuously increases the effort of creating excellent human resources and prospective leaders facing global competition. Segala sesuatu bahkan kesulitan seberat apapun bisa terselesaikan dengan gotong royong, sinergi. Sinergi bagi keberhasilan untak Surabaya itu adalah kunci utama. Founded in 1958, Untak Surabaya is one of the first private university in East Java. Today, Untak Surabaya continues to grow by practicing the principles of good university governance that is credible, transparent, accountable, and responsible management. The university's vision is to become an excellent nation's values and character-based university in 2035. Therefore, Untak Surabaya established its strategic plan in research and community service focusing on eight prime fields, food and agriculture, renewable energy, transportation, information technology and communication, advanced material, maritime, disaster, social and humanities. Center of Renewable Energy expand the academic research into technological engineering and implementation of renewable energy. Academics and students are encouraged to demonstrate their innovation and creativity in this field. Electricity generating stove, electricity generating stairs, and electric car kunting sakti. Center of Advanced Materials focus on the research and development of alternative metal replacement in order to support enhancements of sustainable energy, food security, and national resilience. One of the innovation produced is double-bladed rubber, which is using light and cheap, yet solid material that helps traditional fishermen intensifying their productivity. Center of Demography and Environmental Studies focus on researching the dynamics of the society and its surroundings. The center also encourages community to live the environmentally aware and healthy life. Center of Constitution and Decentralization evidently experience in wide range of research regarding legal issue, policy making, and legislators' matter. Center of Mitigation and Disaster is founded to conduct studies on nature conservation and disaster management as well as expanding the possibility of developing disaster management technology. Center of Literature and Cultural Studies focus on the research of Indonesian literature, language, and culture. The center is aiming to preserve and develop the nation's value and characters. Center of Gender Studies and Child Protection is actively encouraged to write the research and raise the wider awareness on gender mainstreaming, women empowerment, and child protection. Center of Food Technology Medicinal plants and halal food is designed to explore the alternative food materials and food processing and to promote the significance of halal products. Center of Human Resources Development Research and Community Service in order to facilitate the improvement of quality and performance of human resources. Intellectual Property Rights Center develop research 
based on intellectual property right to encourage and protect the intellectual property of that community. Untak Surabaya also has two business units, fertilizer or pupuk cap jempol, and mineral water. Both are the result of research downstream in order to the independence of institutional funding. Untak Surabaya Eco Campus continuously improves the effort aligned with nature and environment, started from the nearest to the easiest way of getting things can be done by all the Civitas Academica. Untak Surabaya gradually and continuously increases the effort of creating excellent human resources and prospective leaders in facing global competition. Segala sesuatu bahkan kesulitan seberat apapun bisa terselesaikan dengan gotong royong, sinergi. Sinergi bagi keberhasilan untak Surabaya itu adalah kunci utama. Founded in 1958, Untak Surabaya is one of the first private university in East Java. Today, Untak Surabaya continues to grow by practicing the principles of good university governance that is credible, transparent, accountable, and responsible management. The university's vision is to become an excellent nation's values and character-based university in 2035. Therefore, Untak Surabaya established its strategic plan in research and community service focusing on eight prime fields, food and agriculture, renewable energy, transportation, information technology and communication, advanced material, maritime, disaster, social and humanities. Center of Renewable Energy expand the academic research into technological engineering and implementation of renewable energy. Academics and students are encouraged to demonstrate their innovation and creativity in this field. Electricity generating stove, electricity generating stairs, and electric car kunting sakti. Center of Advanced Materials focus on the research and development of alternative metal replacement in order to support enhancements of sustainable energy, food security, and national resilience. One of the innovation produced is double-bladed propeller, which is using light and cheaper, yet solid material that helps traditional fishermen intensifying their productivity. Center of Demographic and Environmental Studies focus on researching the dynamics of the society and its surrounding. Center also encourages community to live environmentally aware and healthy living. Center of Constitution and Decentralization evidently experience in wide range of research regarding legal issue, policy making, and legislators making. Center of Mitigation and Disaster is founded to conduct studies on nature conservation and disaster management as well as expanding the possibility of developing disaster management technologies. Center of Literature and Cultural Studies focus on the research of Indonesian literature, language, and culture. The center is aiming to preserve and develop the nation's value and characters. Center of Gender Studies and Child Protection is actively encouraged variety research and raise the wider awareness on gender mainstreaming, women empowerment, and child protection. Center of Food Technology Medicinal plants and halal food is designed to explore the alternative food materials and food processing and to promote the significance of halal products. Center of Human Resources Development Research and Community Service in order to facilitate the improvement of quality and performance of human resources. Intellectual Property Rights Center 
develop research based on intellectual property rights to encourage and protect the intellectual property of that community. Untak Surabaya also has two business units, fertilizer or pupuk cap jempol, and mineral water. Both are the result of research downstream in order to the independence of institutional funding. Untak Surabaya Eco Campus continuously improve the effort aligned with nature and environment, started from the nearest to the easiest way of getting things can be done by all the Civitas Academica. Untak Surabaya gradually and continuously increases the effort of creating excellent human resources and prospective leaders in facing global competition. Segala sesuatu bahkan kesulitan seberat apapun bisa terselesaikan dengan gotong royong, sinergi. Sinergi bagi keberhasilan untak Surabaya itu adalah kunci utama. Founded in 1958, Untak Surabaya is one of the first private university in East Java. Today, Untak Surabaya continues to grow. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Baik. Selamat pagi. Good morning ladies and gentlemen. Ya. Yeah. Uh, okay, we have Pak Nugroho, we have Okay. Yes, thank you for being ready in this channel. As we, as we are about to begin please to have nice seated stay relaxed and enjoy your time yeah okay we have a note to make before we begin today's seminar i would like to seek your cooperation in completing the seminar first kindly to keep mute your audio to avoid interruption <coughs> Second, please stay tuned. You can use the chat room to communicate. And third, there will be a time for question and discussion at the end of the main session. Thank you for your kind cooperation and attention. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Selamat pagi, bapak-bapak, ibu-ibu. Alhamdulillah telah banyak yang hadir. Ya, cukup untuk kita mulai. Ya, mudah-mudahan nanti akan menyusul lebih banyak lagi. Halo teman-teman doktor kandidat S3 Untak Surabaya, sehat selalu, beberapa nama, saya kenal beberapa tidak, Bu Dewi, Bu, iya, beberapa teman saya. Oh iya, yeah, selamat pagi, sampai ketemu kita ya. Oke, okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. His Excellency, the Rector of Universitas 17 Agustus 1945 Surabaya, Profesor Mulyanto Nugroho, MM, CPA. Good morning, Pak Rektor. How are you? Morning, boleh. Fine. Mm -hmm. It is good to have you here in this Zoom meeting. Yeah. Okay. So, Pak 
Pak Nugroho, Pak Profesor Nugroho ini always look fresh and gorgeous ya. He is always in a youth, youth style. <laughs> His Excellency, the Dean of Economic and Business Faculty, Bapak Dr. Selamat Riyadi. Is it here? Are you here with us, Pak? Belum ya. Okay. And it should be, yeah. Respectable, the head of the IE study program, economics doctoral program, as the host of this international seminar, Professor Tri Ratnawati, MSI, CPA. Good morning, Prof. How are you today? Yes, yes Bukoli. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank okay. you. Welcome to this seminar. Uh, she is our motherhood professor, motherhood professor ya, professor yang keibuan gitu ya. She is a very good motivator, always keeping good and high spirit, selalu semangat ya, Prof Tri ini. Oke. Okay. And next we have uh, the respectable, the keynote speaker. Profesor Dr. Dr. Gigi Hajah Ida Ayu Brahmasari, Diploma, DHE. Is he here already? Oh, not yet. Okay. And the honorable, all the four speakers, they should be here in this time. We have four speakers. Associate Professor Nunung Nurul Hidayah, PhD, from University of Southampton. Oh, she is not here. She, didn't come. she doesn't come yet. And yeah, it is surprising us is to have the Indonesian name from University of Southampton. Yeah, Nunung from University of Southampton. But she is not here yet. And from Malaysia, we have Dr. Amirul Afif Muhammad. Is he here or not? Yeah, I'm here, Madam Chairperson. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Dr. Amirul, nice to meet you again. Yeah. Again yeah. and again, yeah, Prof. Yeah. Nice to see you. <laughs> Assalamualaikum, Dato. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Alhamdulillah, thanks. Uh -huh. Gembira berjumpa lagi dengan awak, ya. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have many times collaboration, Prof, but we still need you. We want to get and dig knowledge from you again and again. Yeah, how is Malaysia now? Alhamdulillah, I think everything is getting better, and it's good to see Prof mm -hmm. Mulyanto again. Yeah, salam takzim, Prof. Yeah, nice to see Prof Tri, Prof Mulyanto. Nice okay. to meet you, <laughs> Dr. Amirul. <laughs> okay, thank you for uh, being here with us, Prof. Amirul. And then from we have from Thailand, Dr. Marlon Rail Astelaro. Is he here? Yes, I'm here. Oh, yeah. Good morning, uh, Dr. Selamat Marlon. Back. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi. Ya. Yeah. Oh, terima kasih. Selamat pagi. Apa kabar, Dr. Marlon? Thank you, Madam, for uh, inviting me here. Yeah. This is your second time here, ya? Yeah? I second think time. so. Yeah. Last year, you were with us. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Welcome. Thank you. Well, thank yeah. You. Last year. In the same uh, event, it's a it's a yeah. Okay, welcome to Kampus Merah Putih, University of 17 Agustus 1945, Surabaya. Okay, thank you for spending your time for us. And from Timor Leste, we have Dr. Alexandre de Sousa Guterres. Are you here? Is he here with us? Oh, not yet. Okay. And Professor Nunu. And the last but not least, the Honorable Dr. Sihab Ridwan. 
Halo, good morning. Assalamualaikum, Dr. Sihab Ridwan. Waalaikumsalam. Good. Thank you. How are you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Good. Yeah. Yeah, this is our lecturer. He is always smart and charming, ya, yeah? Pak <laughs> Profesor Sihab ini. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. The respectable all the participants of this seminar. First of all, let us thank to Almighty Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala who has given us some mercies and blessings, so that we can attend this agenda without any obstacles. Secondly, salawat and salam. May always be given to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who has guided us from the darkness to the lightness. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Olisidayati. I will be your master ceremony for the two series agendas this morning and all day long. Ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's seminar, Friday, August the 5th, 2022, the International Conference on Economic Management and Accounting. This is a regular yearly agenda from the DIE, Dr. Ilmu Ekonomi Study Program, uh, Economic Business Faculty, UNTAK, Surabaya. The seminar brings together five institutions, University of 17 Agustus 1945 Surabaya, University Technology Mara, UITM Malaysia, University of Southampton, England, Raja Mangala University of Technology, Kruntep, Thailand, and Universidad de Depas, Timor Leste. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the host, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. We appreciate you taking off your busy schedules to join us today. We hope you will find the program we have lined up for you to be fruitful and engaging. Yeah, uh, many participants we have today, this morning, How many participants we have this morning? Yeah, 112. 112 participants in the Zoom line. And we opened the YouTube line as well, I think. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you again. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to Campus Merah Putih. Ladies and gentlemen, on this occasion, allow me to introduce you to today's agendas. The first is opening, and then we have welcoming speech and keynote speech, keynote speaker, and the main session presentation from all the speakers, breaking time, and closing. Distinguished. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let us open the seminar ceremony by reciting Basmalah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. With the name of Allah, the most merciful, the all merciful. Next agenda will be an opening speech. Allow me to invite Professor Mulyanto Nugroho, MMCPA, Director of University of 17 Agustus 1945, Surabaya, to deliver an opening speech. Please welcome Professor Mulyanto Nugroho. Time is yours. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the International Conference on Economic Management and Counting, ICOMA 2022. Welcome to Kampus Merah Putih, Untuk Surabaya. Punca 17 Agustus 1945, Surabaya. The short name, Untuk Surabaya. 
I would like to express my warmest greeting to all of the keynote speaker, presenter, and participant from various university in Indonesia and several other country. My special greeting to Honorable Professor Dr. Dr. Ki Hajah Idayu Brahmasari, Diploma DHE MPA from Surabaya, Indonesia. Uh, Associate Professor Nunung Nurul Hidayah, PhD from the University of Southampton, United Kingdom. Pak Marlon Rail Astilero, PhD from Raja Manggal, Raja Manggal University of Technology Thailand. Uh, Associate Professor Dr. Amirul Afif Muhammad from University of Technology Mara Shah Alam, Malaysia. Dr. Alexandre de Sousa, Dr. Lik Eko MM from University of the pas da pas tiboliste and to prof tri ratnawati as the head head of doctor in economic program in untak surabaya who is coordinating this amazing conference i'm very happy to be able to welcome you online to our conference knowing knowing that you will be joining this event from many corner of the world and in reaching the International Academic Forum with your own national, culture, disciplinary, and personal perspective. Uh, the topic of our conference this year is Green Economy and Artificial Intelligence to Sustainable Growth. It is very relevant topic to our current situation where the Future is full and uncertainty, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic hits. The pandemic has revealed the systemic frailty of our global economic and society. It is a wake-up call for all of us to address the sustainable problem we face. Social and economic practice must change across different level and respect of society. One of our options is the green economy, which is a alternative vision for growth and development. The one that can generate economic development and improvement in people's life in ways consistent with advancing the environment and social well-being. One significant component of a green economy strategy is to promote the development and adoption and sustainable technology. This is where artificial intelligence come into play. We can see its role during the pandemic throughs, the effective COVID-19 vaccine that was able to be released too quickly because the use of AI speeds up the development. There are many other ex ex examples of how expand in AI, AI could support our understanding of climate change. Enable our transition to sustainable transport systems and even accelerate agro technology to help and food property and malnutrition. So, thank you all for joining ICOMA 2022. I'm looking forward to your active participant in this event. Good morning, everybody. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Mute, mute, police. You mute, you you mute, mute. Police. Okay. okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Muran Yunanton Graha, for your delightful speech. Yeah. We know that green economics, artificial intelligence, and sustainables are all our issues in this. And, to, and today's economy. Thank you. 
And ladies and gentlemen, uh, is Prof. Sari here? Prof. Sari, Prof. Sari. Ibu Ayu Brahma Sari. Halo, Prof. Sari. Good morning, Prof. Sari. Prof. Ida Ayu. Prof. Sari, yeah. I think, is the last speaker. For the oh, yeah, the last speaker, I think, Dr. Marlon Ren from Thailand. And the second oh. is Dr. Amirul. The third speaker is Dr. Alexander. And the last speaker is Prof. Brahma Sari. Yeah. Okay. okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Bapak, Ibu yang berbahagia, ladies and gentlemen, So now we get, we proceed to the uh, seminar agenda, our main agenda. Uh, as I said before, this presentation will be delivered by four speakers, Dr. Marlon, Dr. Amiru, Professor Nuno, and Dr. Alexander. Okay, so, yeah, because the keynote speaker is not here yet. Yeah. So uh, we give the time to Dr. Muhammad Sihab as the moderator of uh, as, as the moderator of the main agenda. Okay, for all the audiences during this session, please kindly prepare your question. Yeah? You can have either directly after the session or directly right on the chat room. The committee will manage them for you. We will try to share the questions uh, on the screen. Please, the questions should be short, brief, and directly go to the point. Okay, now time is yours, Pak Dr. Muhammad Sihab. You are okay. now as the moderator of the main session. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Polis Hidayati. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. all the before we start uh, the presentation and in order to avoid the disturbances during the conference i would like to ask you yeah, uh, to mute your uh, gadget yeah. Into silent, yeah. Let's do, yeah. Okay, let's do. Uh, yeah. Okay, please. Yeah, it's keep okay. Okay. Me on. Okay. The honorable master and madam speakers, distinguished guests, fellow students. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Yeah. Assalamualaikum again. Yeah. First of all, I would like to welcome you all to this at international conference on economic management and accounting, ICOEMA. 2020 with the theme Green Economy and Artificial Intelligence to Sustainable Growth held by the doctoral program of Economics, Faculty of Business, Faculty of Economics and Business, University of Tujuh Agustus, Surabaya. In this occasion, we shall have outstanding uh, presentation from our prominent speaker, whom I believe shall in right our insight and knowledge regarding the theme of this conference. Before the presentation begins, allow me to introduce the speaker. The first speaker, 
that is Dr. Marlon Ryan from Thailand. He teaches management and human resource management course to undergraduate, undergraduate and graduate students and the International College of Rajamangala University of Technology Frankfurt in Bangkok, Thailand. He is originally from the Philippines where he finished his doctorate in management from the Catholic University of San Jose Recolectus in the central Philippine city of Cebu. Back in the Philippines, he also taught different private and public universities before joining the academy, he used to work in San Miguel Corporation, one of the largest food and drink business in the Asian region. His industry experience has become a handy tool in his teaching profession. Uh, his presentation is about the uh, artificial intelligence to sustainable growth, green economy, and artificial intelligence to sustainable growth. Okay. Uh, time is just yet. Yeah. I give time around 20 minutes for Dr. Marin Landro. Yeah. Uh, now, floor is yours. Good morning, sir. Um, Salamat pagi. Terima kasih again, Banyak, uh, for the invitation. Dr. Muhammad, good morning. Okay, I hope you see your present, uh, my presentation. Can you hear me, sir? Um, Dr. Muhammad, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much again for the kind invitation uh, for this uh, prestigious conference. Um, as, as, as mentioned by Dr. Muhammad, I am uh, currently based in Bangkok, Thailand, but I am from the Philippines. And I'd like to touch on the presentation on going green, probably it should not just be higher education, but uh, in the education sector uh, generally. Because um, I think uh, the theme of today's international conference is an aspiration that we transition towards green economy and um, in, um, artificial intelligence uh, for sustainable uh, growth. But um, my presentation is aimed at um, maybe, maybe, maybe creating some kind of, um, I hope it triggers some kind of, um, of um, a light bulb moment for all of us because uh, there has been a lot of uh, discussions about going green uh, or transitioning towards green economy, but have we really uh, solved uh, the basic firsts? as far as going green. So for example, um, this is something which we always see in the news here in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, smog choke Bangkok struggles to improve air quality. Uh, if you have been to Bangkok, Thailand, the air quality here is not really very good for your health. So even before COVID, Bangkokians already uh, are wearing masks to protect themselves from the bad quality air quality of uh, Bangkok. Bangkok, another, 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 another um, 
headline from the Bangkok Post um, has this, Bangkok has world's third worst air quality. Another one is uh, Bangkok air uh, is healthy only in the first 100 days. So the rest of the year, Bangkok air quality is not really good. In fact, uh, it even make COVID-19 more deadly, especially for those who have underlying health issues. So what are the causes of this uh, um, air quality problem? They have, uh, they, have, uh, they have identified diesel fumes from cars because traffic also in Bangkok is really very bad. There are uh, issues also as far as agricultural burning, then the secondary aerosols from constructions. So these are the realities that we are facing here in Bangkok every single day. And if air quality is not enough, then we have other issues that we are also dealing here in Bangkok. This one. Flooding. You know that Bangkok lies uh, below say, sea level. So every day in the last few weeks where there is uh, 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 the, 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 the regular rainfall here in Bangkok, we also experience a lot of flooding. And the cause of that is, as you can see in the picture, plastic. When you throw away your garbage anywhere, believing that, well, it's just a small plastic, it will not plug the canals or it will not plug um, um, the rivers. But if there are five of you who will throw plastics on the canal, it will accumulate into something like this in the picture. So what did the Thai government, uh, what did the Thai government do? Thai government bans plastic. In 2020, the plastic ban was implemented. But was it enough to solve the problem? Obviously, banning the plastic is not enough because the plastic was banned only in supermarkets. But how many supermarkets are in Thailand? Only very few. Those, people's, uh, those people... Um, those people who are selling stuffs along the street, they still use plastic. And there are more of them than those who are uh, doing their groceries in the supermarket. So we'll go into uh, the details of this problem, <clears throat> plastic problem. It says here, according to Ocean Crusaders, every year, 6.4 million tons of plastic are dumped into the ocean. That is equivalent to 3,200 kilometers of trucks loaded with garbage. Growing green could surely help eliminate this. Maybe not on the first year of going green or adopting green, more greener environment environment-friendly economy. But the reality is this is really happening. This one, how many of us use plastic spoon and fork every day when we go out to eat? How many of us here cannot drink without a straw? We buy soft drinks, we buy something to drink outside, here in Bangkok, even water, bottled water, they drink it using plastic straw. Plastic cups or plastic glass, very convenient. We go out with our friends on a picnic. Um, what we usually do is buy plastic cups because we don't want to bring a lot and bring, again, all these things, utensils back home. We want always to travel light, buy something along the way, plastic, very convenient. Okay. 
styrofoam. Very convenient. But what is the effect of asking someone, you want a takeaway? How do you want it to be wrapped, madam? I want it to be wrapped. You, and you have styrofoam. And what are you supposed to do when you go home with your styrofoam? Throw it away. Then the ever-present plastic bag. How many of us even bring our own plastic bag when we go to the market or we go to the grocery? Most probably, we don't. Because anyway, when we go out, plastic bag is free. As far as plastic problem is concerned, these are the three polluters. As far as plastic waste is concerned, this is, in, this is two years ago. I don't know if there are changes with this two years after COVID. Did, uh, the, the, did the figure decrease because a lot of us stayed home for during the COVID pandemic? But the reality is this 3 million, 3.5 million, 5 million, 2.5 million plastics will quite certainly are still there in the environment, polluting the environment. If we aspire to have the green economy, this should be solved first. Okay. Look at this. According to ocean crusaders, 100,000 marine creatures die every year from plastic entanglement. Imagine yourself being a marine environment, a marine creature. Imagine yourself as a seal as a dolphin. You probably say, we probably say, well, uh, it doesn't make any sense to me because uh, they, cannot, they do not contribute to the economy anyway. This one. Approximately 1 million seabirds die from plastic. These are good reasons why we should transition to green economy. But transitioning to green economy is expensive. You're not just going to count one to 10 and wake up the following day or just go to sleep and wake up the following day and oh, the economy is more environment friend. These are the products of today's economic, um, how do you call that, a model. These are the most common plastic items we usually use. Plastic bags, sachets, you must be familiar with sachets, or small packs of maybe whatever that you can buy uh, outside. Because uh, of these small packs, it's easy to, for us to just throw it away. Then plastic bottles. So the, as far as the composition rates of marine debris that, that, that killed 100,000 marine creatures every year and uh, 1 million seabirds every year, these are the different items. And the fishing line that entangles the poor marine creature will last for 600 years. The plastic bottle that we are using because of convenience, it will take 450 years. If you are if you are smoking that cigarette butt that you throw away 
it takes five years for that. to decompose. The aluminum can that you use, it will take 200 years. If you have kids, because everybody now uses diaper, that one diaper, you have to wait 450 years for that diaper to decompose. It's a long way to achieve that green economy that we are aspiring. Because the reality here is this one still exists right now. And this one, we have to do something about this. The plastic straw, 200 years. So it takes how many generations of your family before you can say, oh, that has already been decomposed. Okay. Waste problem is destructive. As they say, you reap what you sow. What goes around like in Bangladesh, not just in Bangladesh, you know, my country, Philippines is very prone to natural disaster. Just recently, we suffered, we were hit by an earthquake, the Northern Philippines. And since the Philippines is also very prone to typhoons, we experience this quite regularly. It has become just a normal happening. And what makes it worse? Because of clogged drains. Who clogged the drain? Is it the monkeys? Is it the dogs? We humans plug the drain. As far as uh, corporate uh, polluters are concerned, these are, according to trashero.org, trashero.org, these are the world's top polluters. And this is even ranked way back in 2019. The world's top corporate polluters in 2019, number one is Coca-Cola, the world's number one drink. They have drinks in plastic. They have drinks in can. And plastics, according to our previous uh, uh, slide, it takes how many years for it to decompose? And cans, how many years for it to decompose? Nestle, Pepsi Cola, and so on and so forth. Look at uh, look at the uh, uh, the list from one, number one to number ten. Maybe we are buying products five out of ten, six out of ten of these companies. So we ourselves are also become polluters in partnership with this corporate. Um, companies. Now we go to technology. Who doesn't have who doesn't have a computer nowadays? Who doesn't have a cell phone or mobile phone nowadays? Nowadays, it's not a matter of do you have a mobile phone, but it's a question of how many mobile phones do you own? Some people own two, three mobile phones. So what about the old mobile phones? What happened to them? You remember your old mobile phones? Are, still with, are they still with you or you, you threw them away? So according to the worldcounts.com, 
Electronic wastes, we generate around 40 million tons of electronic waste every year. That is like growing 800 laptops every second. How often do you change your mobile phone? Every year? Twice a year? Where do you think your old mobile phone goes? The most common hazardous electronic items include LCD desktop monitors, LCD plasma, LCD uh, television, LCD desktop monitors, LCD television, plasma television, TVs, and the old, which is no longer used, the old computers with CRT the one that looks like a box. Now television set is very easy to procure. So what do you do with your old television set? Throw it away in the garbage bin. Where do you think it goes? It goes to this space. It goes to this empty place that we use as a garbage site for electronic wastes. And what do you think the effect of this to the environment? Printer. Ink. We have that in our schools. E-wastes, according again to the worldcounts.com, contain substances which many are toxic. Mercury, lead, arsenic, those who are chemistry experts, you know this very well. Are we guilty of this? Yes, because we do print every single day. We don't even recycle our papers. Okay, so the culture of use and throw away, what did it give us? E-waste comprise 70% of our overall toxic wastes. That is the sad reality. We are actually living with toxic wastes. Only 12.5% of e-waste is recycled. 85% of e-waste are sent to landfills and incinerators, mostly burned, and, it, uh, and releases harmful toxins in the air. So these are really good reasons to transition into green economy. 80% of e-waste in the U.S. and most of other countries are transported to Asia. Just very recently here in Bangkok, the Thai government uh, instructed that wastes that came from, sent here by Australians, will be returned to Australia. Few years ago, waste from Canada ended up in the Philippines as well. I don't know how it happened. The government of the Philippines demanded the Canadian the government to bring back those waste be sent to the Philippines. I don't know if you have experience that in Indonesia. 
300 million computers and 1 billion cell phones. Three hundred million computers and one billion cell phones are produced annually, and it is expected that it will grow for eight percent per year. Imagine one billion cell phones, because you want always the latest cell phones or the latest model of the cell phone. Where will it go? the old discarded cell phone. So you contribute to the 70% toxic wastes. So how about our school? How do we contribute to waste pollution? To pollution. We cannot deny that we usually teach something but do another thing. That is the reality. We're good in theory, but not good in practice. It hurts, but that is it. Reality hurts. This one is from here. It is here from my university. Thailand being the number one polluter of plastic. So it's very consistent. Canteen trash is real. Nobody cares. Nobody give a damn. Just clean it up, bring it out. That's all. What happens to this trash? We don't know. We don't even have some kind of segregation. Put everything there in one place in one bin just get rid of it let other people do the problem solve the problem okay this one here paper products Ink cartridges, computer, old computer parts, air conditioning system, plastic and packaging products. We, so, we still do that. We still use that in school. Paper products, for example, we still require students to print. We still require them to give us hard copy, printed copy. And it's harmful for the environment because paper products are from uh, usually from trees. Ink cartridges. How many ink cartridges do you dispose every month? Because you need to print every single report that you need to give to your boss because your boss is not familiar with technology. He or she doesn't like to read emails. He or she doesn't like the idea of looking at it from a computer. Cleaning materials that we use for our floors, for our toilets, for, for, uh, to clean the environment. We clean the environment. I mean, we clean our rooms, our toilet, but this, this, the irony here is this cleaning materials is harmful to the environment. Air conditioning system, you're the only one in the room but we still use air conditioning, which is my university is a little bit guilty because our air conditioning is so very centralized. Even if you're the only person in the room, you have to turn on the entire system. That is the reality. Okay. So maybe it's about time that we have to go Green, introduce green alternatives. No longer requiring books. Instead, we will be using online learning materials. Make our library system be available online. Most of us, we have available online resources, but students are not familiar with how to use it because it entails a lot of work as well. You go online, you need to register, you need to do this, you need to do that. 
Okay. Why don't we use online attendance and as our well as our grading uh, com uh, computation will be meet, made online. Online examination as well. The, the, the COVID-19 taught us or still teaching us how to transition into paperless transactions. Enrollment, registration. Do we need to let the students come to the campus to enroll? Or to register, or we have to, we can uh, ask them to go online, or or uh, and uh, and and do their transactions online. We don't need to, we don't need to check uh, their um, their online registration receipt, uh, asking for uh, asking for printouts. Instead, we will also check it online if they're registered in our class. Maybe in our university that can be done, but there's there's still other schools in the country or in the world, especially in Asia, that is still relying on traditional ways of doing registration, online examination, and uh, the usual uh, requirement for learning materials. Okay. Now, because of COVID-19, COVID-19, uh, even if COVID-19 will be, will be solved, I think uh, the blended learning is here to stay because this is the future of this is the future of uh, education blended online as it happens education on demand so in our in our university we are trying to explore blended learning uh, a combination of online class as well as um, in person in person uh, class in my class in my in my practice i usually just do everything online even submission of uh, even before even before covid-19 i encourage my students to to um, submit everything online that's why we organize usually uh, the google classroom because it's very convenient you just don't need to have a google account and you have access to different uh, it's like kind of a learning management, uh, learning management uh, system. We have also to we have also to implement uh, recycling in our offices uh, because um, I noticed that most of the people they want always clean paper. They always want the best quality of paper. They don't even know how to recycle paper. So in our office now, we encourage uh, print only as necessary. If it's not necessary, if you can, if you can send it through email or if you can have it in our low, uh, in our group messenger uh, uh, messaging app, so we will get all the information from there. We only uh, need to go uh, print paper if it's uh, it's a legal uh, requirement. For example, it's a contract and we need to have it signed by a lawyer or maybe we need to submit it to immigration or to the labor office or the tax office. Everything else is, uh, has to go uh, paperless. So we also have uh, initiated an online document and records management system wherein um, everything can be accessed using online uh, or using a computer uh, network. So that uh, the 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 lesser that we use printer uh, or paper, uh, the better the better for us. Okay. So our invitation also here are being done using online. So we send invitation through email, just as uh, uh, um, you inside you send me an invitation uh, via email. It will not uh, it will not make the invitation less formal if it is invite if you are invited. Uh, using uh, email. Our HR information system is also being uh, converted into online uh, HR information, HRIS, or the online uh, information system. Uh, payment also nowadays here in Bangkok, not just in our school, but in, uh, usually Bangkok, we usually encourage online payment uh, so that we, will not, we don't have to go to, we don't have to go to an ATM uh, and, and, uh, and print uh, account balance and, uh, and everything. Uh, that is one of the that is what of one of the innovations that we are trying to that we are trying to uh, to, to do. 
then as far as um, as far as um, uh, energy is concerned, the university is exp uh, exploring the possibility because we are in in, in, in Asia and uh, we have abundance of uh, solar energy. So uh, the university is also uh, shifting or trying to shift or trying to use uh, renewable energy as source of um, our energy needs in the university. So we do not, uh, we do not, uh, we don't want to be dependent on fossil, uh, fossil fuel, especially now that uh, it's getting very uh, expensive. And the university is also trying to, uh, the university is also trying to come up with a recycling facility with the help of uh, other faculties like the engineering faculty who will help design uh, a recycling facility that we can uh, use actually uh, we can recycle our own waste here in the university and use it again uh, for the different uh, for the different offices. The online learning management of the university is being uh, implemented now. But our our since our um, in I mean in my in my institute since most of our students are in China and they usually do not. Uh, do not cannot use or cannot access uh, Google Classroom or Western technologies, uh, Western uh, apps and software. So we are using an online learning management using um, Chinese Chinese uh, applications. Okay. Uh, if we are, if we want to help uh, environment, the environment as far uh, as far as uh, technology is concerned. Maybe it's about time that we have to look for these signs because these are, these are, this means that if we have this product with this uh, particular logo or sign, it means that this is, we are actually helping the environment more friendly and we are helping the environment um, by, by, by uh, decreasing our contribution to, uh, to pollution. So lastly, I think uh, it's about time that we have to go back to the basics since we are in the education sector and we have to redesign the curriculum that reflects um, uh, green uh, education. We have to incorporate in our, uh, we have to incorporate in our, in our curriculum the, the green uh, environment on how to, how to solve or how to, how to implement or how to, uh, yeah, how to implement initiatives that will be that will not be harmful to the environment. We also want to come up with policies and guidelines pertaining to purchase of efficient and environment friendly school materials. And since technology is here to stay and we will not go back to stone age, maybe it's about time that we have to also to, to maximize the use of the virtual technology. And uh, when we do our purchasing, we have to uh, make a very good choice by by purchasing also from environment friendly or environmentally committed companies. It's not just because uh, they offer something uh, affordable, but yet and yet uh, the company is not conscious about helping the environment. Uh, we will just purchase for them. It's not no nowadays. It's no longer just about money. It's no longer just about uh, uh, how much we can save, but how much how much we can help the environment. Our conditioning system, maybe the, I, I, I really admire the, I really admire uh, UNTAG because you mentioned in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the, in the video that you have a building that is really very environment friendly. I really want to congratulate you for that because you lead the way for universities in Indonesia and also in Thailand uh, to have that kind of uh, building designed at helping or regulating a heating or air conditioning, uh, air conditioning system, so it's a long way for us uh, for us to go uh, to 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 achieve that green technology that we are uh, aspiring. But uh, hopefully, uh, this presentation will help us uh, realize that this is really the moment. This is really the right time for us to transition to green technology. It's a long way for us, but as they say in one. Uh, in one Chinese proverb, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a simple, a, sim, a single step. And I think uh, the step that we are using now is not uh, is, is the right. Uh, we're we're going to the right uh, uh, way 
uh, by transitioning to uh, to green um, economy. And I would like to thank the the management and the administrators of UNTAG for initiating this kind of this kind of uh, conference because it is very timely and this is what we really need uh, in order for us to survive the next maybe probably 50 or 100 years. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your kind um, invitation and for for listening. Terima kasih banyak kapan kap from Bangkok. Thank you for Dr. Marlon yeah, for your very good uh, presentation. Uh, before we continue to the second speaker, yeah, I would like to give a note here for the presentation of Dr. Manjero yeah, Marlon. Yeah. Yang <laughs> Okay. Uh, in my note here, yeah, uh, there are a lot of uh, presentation yeah, from the tempat group. First, yeah, redesigning the curriculum to reflect the shift to, to green education. Yeah. Jadi, kita perlu redesign ulang, yeah, menyusun ulang kurikulum ya untuk merefleksikan atau mewujudkan satu pergeseran terhadap green uh, education di pendidikan yang akan kita susun perlu merefresh pada uh, apa namanya pendidikan yang lebih uh, hijau ya green education it's very important to design a new curriculum, yeah, yeah, particularly in terms of uh, the green education. The, the first note from Dr. Marlian, yeah. The second note is policies and guidelines pertaining to purchase of energy efficient and environment friendly schools materials. Kebijakan, ya berbagai kebijakan dan berbagai bimbingan terkait pembelian eh, energi yang efisien dan ramah lingkungan. Jadi perlu kita ini apa menyusun satu policy, ya dan juga berbagai kebijakan berbagai apa. Guideline, ya, guidelines tentang pembelian berbagai material di kampus yang ramah lingkungan, yang hemat energi. Itu catatan yang kedua. Catatan yang ketiga, the third note, purchase, uh, maximizing the use of virtual technologies, memaksimalkan pemakaian teknologi virtual. Jadi ini catatan dari Dr. Marlion ya, yang ketiga. We need to maximize the use of uh, virtual technologies ya. Jadi lebih banyak yang bersifat itu virtual dalam interaksi akademik ini. Uh, the fourth note Purchase only from environmentally commitment committed companies. Jadi kita ini membeli bahan-bahan kepada perusahaan yang punya komitmen terhadap lingkungan. Kita yang harus be. We need to make option 
which one company yeah, that committed to friendly uh, environment. Yeah. Jadi kepada lingkungan kepada pada bahan bahan yang ramah lingkungan. Itu yang cara yang ketiga. The fourth uh, not is SVAC control system to better regulate the operation of a heating and or air conditioning system. Sistem kontrol atau sistem pengendalian HVAC kepada untuk menyusun atau meregulasi secara lebih bagus operasi dari sistem pemanas seperti AC dan seterusnya itu. Kita perlu melakukan sistem kontrol ya terhadap pengoperasian itu. Sehingga itu akan mengurangi ke pemakaian energi. Ini beberapa catatan. Ya, itu several notes from Dr. Arlo. Ya, related to his presentation. Ya. Uh, I think, I believe uh, from you all, there are a lot of uh, question ya, or discussion. But I think uh, we will discuss at the end after all presentation uh, finish their presentation yeah now we continue to the second speaker yeah. our second presenter is associate professor dr amirul afif muhammad from uitm University Teknologi Mara, Fakulte of Management and Business yeah. Yeah. Uh, He is a vice dean yeah, in research innovation yeah. uh, and Professor Amirul will present his speech in title yeah. Circular economic and the role of uh, Islamic finance. Okay. Uh, I think we welcome to Professor Amirul. Yeah. We give time of presentation is about 20 minutes. Yeah. Please, Professor Amirul. Floor is yours, yeah. Uh, okay, so, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah, you want me to present live or record it? All. Yang dihormati, Waalaikumsalam. of University 17 Agustus 1945, Prof. Dr. Mugianto Nugroho, yang berusaha Dean of Faculty of Business and Economics, my fellow colleagues at university, as well as students of the University 17 Augustus 1945, Surabaya, Indonesia. I would like to express my gratitude to the University for inviting me to be one of the panel for today's conference, ICOEMA 2022. Before I proceed further, let me introduce a bit on my university so that you will be having some information on where I'm coming from. So basically, I'm from uh, Faculty of Business Management, University of Technology Mara, and our university has been established in 1956, and we have been given or awarded the status of, of university in 1999. And basically, we, in terms of our present, we are all over Malaysia. We have about 34 campuses and 12 UITM branch campuses. And of course, the main campus is one in Shah Alam, and we have about 21 satellite campuses. So the theme of today's conference is on green economy and artificial intelligence to sustainable growth. And I believe that this topic is very, very contemporary and it's something that should be discussed you know, by the students and by the academic fraternity all over the world. And in the context of my presentation, I'll be talking or discussing about the circular economy and the role of Islamic finance. So I believe that 
my topic today will actually contribute to the further discussion towards the theme of ICOEMA a conference on the green economy and sustainable growth. This is the contents for uh, my presentation. So I'll start with introduction and then uh, be information on circular economy and then brief discussion on Islamic finance. And after that, we will see in terms of the connections of circular economy to Islamic finance. Basically, we are looking from the philosophical aspects of the Islamic finance and how does it connect to the greater picture of circular economy. And we'll see in terms of the global development of Islamic finance in the context of circular economy. Basically, uh, on the previous point, we will be discussing or looking from the perspective of theories and the next discussion will be in terms of does these theories or does this concept have been implemented or been taking action by you know any parties in in, in the world and after that we're talking about in terms of the conclusion when we talk about green economy and sustainable growth i believe that the nearest or the latest international agreement that relevant to the context of green economy is Paris Agreement 2016. So this Paris Agreement 2016 is a very important agreement whereby the participating countries are required to contribute and to ensure that their countries are actually contribute towards the reduction of the global climate temperature. And basically, the aims of Paris Agreement 2016 is to reduce global temperature to 2 degrees Celsius. Yeah? And in the context of a circular economy, so basically, this concept is not something new. Eh? If you refer back to previous research in this particular area, this concept has been actually being mooted or being discussed as early as in 1970s. However, I think most of us realize that such important concept is now gaining attention, I think, in the last uh, 10 years, whereby many countries, you know, being in, uh, implementing and being actually uh, formulating strategies to ensure that their economic model are actually becoming a part of this model of circular economy. And this is very very uh, very very actually visible because when we see paris agreement so this important agreement is only being discussed or implemented in 2016 and in the context of islamic finance so how does this niche area really actually fit into the model of skill economy this can be seen from the foundation aspect of Islamic finance which is guided by the high spiritual and also moral values and this concept this moral compass is actually being dictated by the makasid or objective of the sharia and if we look further later on we will see that uh, circular economy and islamic finance is actually parallel and it can be actually implemented in a symbiosis manner it is actually interesting when we look further in terms of the definition of circular economy in previous literature, then we'll see that there are in, inconsistent definitions of circular economy. Basically, when we talk about circular economy, the circular economy is being described or being defined in various uh, definitions, in various contexts, and because of this, it brings lack of clarity to operationalize this particular circular economy implementations or the movement uh, is unable to achieve the maximum level of uh, capacity and when we look back as been highlighted by uh, Kutcher, Rick and Hacker in 2017 so basically in, in their research they have actually uh, highlighted that there are 114 definitions so because of this and due to ongoing conceptual disagreement a notion with several interpretations may actually or eventually collapse or stay in a standstill so basically if we cannot agree yeah on what is the actually the the uh, 
comprehensive concept of circular economy, then when we want to implement it, perhaps we are unable to implement such strategies or the activities will be unable to achieve the desired or the intended circular economy objective. And based on their research, uh, in, uh, when they you know look back in terms of the various concept or definition of circular economy, so Kutcher, Raker, and Hackett actually has come out with a very comprehensive definition of concept of circular economy, whereby they describe it as an economic system that is based on business models which replicate the end life concept with reducing or altern alternatively reusing, recycling, and also recovering materials in production or distribution as well as consumption processes, thus operating at the micro level in the context of products, companies, and consumers, or at the meso level in the context of eco-industrial parks, as well as at the macro level in the context of city, region, nation, and of course, beyond. With the aim to accomplish sustainable development which implies creating environmental quality, economic prosperity, and social equity to the benefit of current and future generations. So basically, the idea of circular economy here is really fit in terms of facilitating or towards achieving the Paris Agreement 2016. So basically, if a country implement this circular economy, so the implication would be one of the one of the implications is in terms of using the natural resources so basically if the resources being used for one particular purpose so through circular economy when the lifespan of the product has actually reached its maximum or reached its uh, expiry date then in circular economy such product will be used or will be modified to be used for another purpose so basically that particular product even though it life has even though its life cycle for or as a product one has already completed but through innovation or through uh, modification this particular product can be used for product a and so on and so forth. So basically, it helps in terms of um, reducing waste, in terms of uh, reducing cost, as well as in terms of preserving the environment. When we talk about Islamic finance, before we discuss further how does Islamic finance fit into the circular economy model. So when we talk about Islamic finance, so we know, I believe that most of us here know that this niche industry or this niche uh, alternative finance is actually gain its foundation from from islam okay so being an industry that actually has its roots in the religion so this industry must behave accordingly when i say it here behave accordingly so it needs to display it needs to display and also exhibit the good moral values features yeah and the main yeah the main concept or the main foundation of Islamic finance is basically to avoid or to eliminate the elements of usury or taking interest the element of gambling as well as uncertainty from the financial dealings as well as other transactions that are against the Islamic teachings so basically in Islamic finance you will be having a uh, another layer of governance whereby the Sharia community will play its role in terms of ensuring that this particular uh, important criteria being observed by, by the Islamic banks and apart from that the Sharia community also play a role to ensure that the Islamic finance as well not only um, ensuring such transaction or dealings are compatible with Sharia or Islamic law but actually beyond that in term of contribute to the to the society and that's why i mentioned here yeah, it emphasizes yeah, the industry emphasizes on moral values good moral values and at the same time it must be commercially viable 
because this is Islamic finance, is it is not a charity body. Yeah, when we talk about charity body, maybe we can actually consider zakat institution. I think in Indonesia it called as Basnas. So that is a charity body. But when we come to the Islamic finance, then we have, for example, Islamic banks or the Islamic insurance or takaful operators. So they are actually commercial entity. So they must be commercially viable because they have the shareholders that they need to report to. But at the same time, they must exhibit the higher order of moral values. It means that the products or the financial transactions are not only Sharia compliant, but it should be beyond that in the sense that the community should be able to feel the benefit of Islamic finance, you know, from the dollar and cents or from the rupiah science you know monetary value okay because in the early um, commencement of islamic finance of course the main objective of the industry at that time is to ensure that the products the transactions meet the sharia uh, sharia regulations yeah so when it comes to the benefits beyond that it would be minimal in the sense that uh, the products not really focus on that particular aspect. Yeah, the main the main concern is to ensure that it does not have element of usury, gambling, uncertainty, and any other you know uh, activities or transaction that against the Islamic teachings. But the, the another layer in terms of the society uh, benefits from such activities are very minimal. So now the industry is no longer at the infancy stage. So the, the, the industry all over the world is growing towards maturity. So now the products is actually looking beyond that. For example, in Malaysia, the product must be um, towards the VBI, value-based intermediaries. It means that the financial institution, especially Islamic finance, is not only providing the financial services, but the products should have additional value. Or the added value out of that and uh, when we talk about the potential growth of the Islamic finance so basically uh, Refinitiv's Islamic finance development report 2021 expect that uh, the industry to grow at least 8% yearly until 2025 so equivalent to about 4.95 trillion US dollar and as I mentioned earlier this industry must fulfill two sacred roles, which are it must be commercially vibrant and also socially responsible. And the main uh, guidance in terms of to ensure that this Islamic finance, uh, the Islamic banks or the takaful operators or the Islamic capital market being guided rightfully is based on the makasid of Sharia or the purpose of Sharia in the context of Islamic finance. It's also being um, being benchmarked against the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and in fact, the Islamic Development Bank, yeah, the supranational institution for the Islamic countries, uh, is actually having its uh, sustainable framework. So basically, the Islamic finance is also towards this. Uh, green economy and sustainable growth all right let's look in terms of the connections of circular economy to islamic finance and as i mentioned earlier uh, when we talk about uh, circular economy and islamic finance basically we will be looking back in terms of the classical economic discussion with regard to this particular aspect so in islam <laughs> the religion prohibit wastage hoarding and extravagance and actually we can see this from the uh, level of necessity yeah, and here we can uh, actually see there are three main categories which are the daruriyat referring to the essentials element, hajiyat referring to the needs, and tasiniyat referring to the luxury or embellishment. So basically, human will fulfill the lower part, the daruriyat part first, the essential. For example, we need food, we need shelter. Hajiyat, basically, the additional needs that we require. For example, we want you know a bigger house for example or we want actually a car to move and when we talk about tasinyat is about luxury of embellishment we means which means that we want to uh, have better in terms of what 
we have actually acquired for example at the hajjah level we might require car yeah, in order to move from one place to another but when we come to tasiniyat we choose a different brand for example some of us here drive bmw or drive mercedes but basically the purpose is to move but tasiniyat is look is actually you know uh, focusing more in terms of the the luxurious aspect however uh, this many other discussion with regard to the level of necessity yeah so when we talk about the level essence level of necessity from another perspective this is actually depending on the status or maybe a background of that particular person yeah so if let's say a, a person yeah, if let's say there's a person who is actually uh, maybe a corporate figure for example and when we talk about this particular person level of necessity in terms of daruriyat, hajjat and tasniyat so for this particular person it might be different from from ordinary person from people like me or for people like you because of the status of the person so this level of necessity is actually yeah from another perspective or from another school of thought is actually different it is depends on the on the background or the basically the the income level of that particular person and this level of necessity is actually uh, very fluid in the sense that it is dynamic to actually suit the the uh, different change of time and also period yeah so uh, basically we we cannot uh, you know just uh, be simplistic in term of looking or judging a person okay because if we look yeah in islam at the end of the day things that differentiate a person to another is in term of the level of piety yeah the level of iman of a person to the to the god yeah, to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so basically this from the concept or from the perspective of uh, islamic economy okay but when it comes to the secular economy as well if you look here if let's say uh, we practice this uh, level of necessity okay so uh, is it is actually a parallel or actually contribute to the secular economy because of uh, in islam we being encouraged we are being actually told to be actually moderate yeah to be moderate means that we shouldn't be towards luxury too much you know because some you know, part of our property you know needs to be uh, given out as zakat or am tax to be given out as sadaqah and so forth so basically when it comes to this particular concept is this it is actually in sync yeah with the secular economy this diagram of circularity strategies within the production chain in order of priority is actually adapt, adopted from Potting, Hackett, Worrell and Michael 2017. So if you look here, this diagram is, is a very good diagram. It's very clear in terms of showing how does circular, uh, circular uh, concept, yeah, circular economic concept will actually uh, contribute towards the society, towards the environment yeah, in terms of during the product development stage. And if you look here, so this is the linear economy, eh, which is actually the product being used. And then after that is towards, um, we call it, towards the expir expiration of the particular product. Yeah. So if you look here, the rule of thumb, higher level of circularity means fewer natural resources and less environmental pressure. So basically, if in a particular country, yeah, focus more on security so basically is towards preserving the environmental towards reducing the less or pressure in term of environmental protection issue because less or fewer natural resources that being that being used and in terms of strategy here we can see that there are three main components one will be in terms of smarter product use and manufacture followed by another category is extend lifespan of product and its part and of course last but not least is useful application of materials and when we look at the first component here smarter product use and manufacture so basically it must encompass these three main aspects which is refuse reaching and reduce refuse basically the product uh, 
will be made redundant by abandoning its function or by offering the same function with a radically different product. So basically, the product that being developed should actually having a better function. Okay, better function than the previous product. Second, in terms of rating, yeah? so the product you will be used more intensive through sharing of products or by putting multifunctional products on the on the market. So instead of having one product for a single purpose, then you will see that more product yeah, that will be able to use various function. Yeah? So basically, it's not only uh, cost saving to the to the consumer because by purchasing one particular product, it can serve many other functions but it is actually preserving in term of uh, less resources that being used to make or to manufacture to manufacture additional product and okay? that can be actually function by one single product and then reduce in term of increased efficiency in product manufacture or you fewer natural resources and materials and for the second category in terms of extend lifespan of product and its parts, so basically it focuses in terms of the reuse, repair, refurbish, remanufacture, and also repurpose. And for reuse means uh, reuse by another consumer of this kind of product which is in still good condition and fulfill its original function. For example, the you know by selling a pre-loved item, pre-loved uh, goods, for example, so that kind of reuse by other particular uh, by other per uh, person. Repair basically in terms of repair and maintenance or defective product so that it can be used with its original function. Refurbish in terms of restore an old product and bring it up to date. Okay, so means that we uh, do some modification, maybe we put extra features, for example, or extra function so it can become uh, you know relevant again. Remanufacture use parts of the discarded product in a new product with the same function. Yeah and repurpose, use discarded product or its parts in a new product with a different function. So basically, this is also another aspect that being uh, focused, eh, being focusing by the manufacturer eh, because it's not only, again, reduce cost uh, using less uh, resources, but it's also cheaper, eh, cheaper in the sense that um, instead of, you know, uh, producing new, you just, you know, uh, do some modification, repurpose of the particular product so that it can be relevant again. And last but not least, in terms of useful application of materials, basically focus on recycle, process material to obtain the same high grade or lower quality. Eh? I mean, basically, uh, by having the item that is that already being discarded, for example, so it be processed to produce a new product that has the same quality. Eh? Or maybe slightly less quality, but still, you know, considered as safe to be used. And recover, basically, this will be the last aspect, you know, uh, the product being uh, incinerated yeah, in terms of uh, to gain energy, yeah, to gain energy from incineration of the particular materials, for example, to produce electricity, yeah, and all of these require innovations in technology, innovation in product, yeah, in design, innovation in design, and of course, we need to have the social institutional change. Means that government also must play important uh, role here. Okay, this is example. Yeah? So before this, uh, I have shared in terms of the concept, yeah? the ideas of a circular economy, the idea of uh, Islamic finance and how does it can you know fit into the circular economy model in terms of global development of Islamic finance in the context of circular economy so this is in terms of the the real practice or the implementation that has been uh, carried out by uh, some uh, parties all over the world so as I mentioned earlier eh, so the Islamic Development yeah, Bank eh, the Supra National yeah, Bank yeah, has actually come up with its sustainable finance framework yeah, yeah. So this financial framework, uh, finance framework presents the direction of IDB when providing financing to the to the members. So it it ensures that uh, the countries, yeah, the participating countries okay. who become members to uh, IDB yeah, yeah. to be uh, to make sure that the financing that being request is uh, able to fulfill the sustainable, okay. yeah, sustainable activities on that particular country. And here, I think, yeah, here is Indonesia, yeah, the 
establishment of garbage bank eh, whereby this is part of micro financing facility eh, that can actually help the public in Indonesia. So uh, I being understood that uh, through this particular garbage bank, yeah, the public or the local can actually uh, acquire uh, micro financing from this particular bank and they can pay it by you know uh, selling the maybe recycle uh, product or you know uh, rubbish you know that can be actually recycled so it will be able to actually uh, uh, use to uh, pay for the load that being borrowed and then in terms of solar uh, in terms of solar power yeah so this is uh, based on the experience of Tadao Energy Sindam Brahat and Quantum Solar. So basically this is a nation-based firm. So they have issued green sukuk, yeah, green Islamic bond of uh, MY, uh, Malaysia Ringgit 250 um, million and also 1 billion. Yeah? And when it comes to Indonesia as well, recently in 2018, issued sovereign green sukuk yeah, valued at 1.25 billion US dollar and uh, another um, interesting aspect is that uh, in, in Dubai yeah, in, in sorry in, in United Arab Emirates so uh, they have actually used camel manure uh, to produce fuel yeah, from the camel waste so they use it to produce uh, fuel that is actually able to provide uh, energy yeah, for the cement factory so, so this is an uh, interesting concept and uh, part of this activity uh, being financed by the uh, Islamic financial instrument as well. So as a conclusion, uh, basically the notion, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the notion or the idea of circular economy is not new in the context of Islamic finance. It is being embedded actually in the philosophy. Uh, but what is new in terms of the application or the implementation? Eh? Basically, the concept is being embedded there. Yeah? Since um, Islam being actually propagated by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But in terms of implementation eh, within the situation of nowadays, so that is something that needs to be explored further and needs to actually be formulated by the Islamic finance players and also the the society as well as the, the government of each country and in terms of um, uh, the sector participants or the stakeholders they must strategically institutionalize yeah this circular economic activities in the industry and the community basically it, it shouldn't be only within the discussion in the university or academically so it must be implemented and basically this has been implemented by many countries all over the world yeah but how does such implementation can be made widespread? So that is something that needs to be explored further. And in terms of recent development, yeah, so I've shown you yeah, some example of how Islamic finance yeah, being actually uh, contribute towards the circular economy activities. For example, uh, the sukuk that we issued in Malaysia and Indonesia, the use of camel waste to generate uh, energy, yeah? for example, the uh, garbage bank in Indonesia. So those are examples on how does this particular uh, activities can actually assist yeah? circular economy within the context of finance. Thank you. So I hope that uh, my presentation just now to some extent has able to give you something as food for thought to be considered and hopefully it can you know assist in terms of your research or in terms of your study so thank you very much and have a good day assalamu alaikum uh, thank you for Associate Professor Dr. Amirul Afib yeah, from UITM. Yeah. Thanks for your very good uh, speech. Yeah. Uh, let's give once again a big round of applause for Professor 
Amirul Afif ya. Oke. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we continue to the next uh, speaker. The third speaker ya. Yeah. Will yeah. presented, it will be presented by uh, Dr. Alexander de Sosa Guterres, MM, yeah, from University Dapas Timur Leste. He will present uh, his paper entitled Pillars of Sustainable Regional Economic Development. However, before uh, giving to the Dr. Alex, I would like to make a note from the presentation of Professor Amirum. I have uh, several notes yeah, for the presentation of Dr. Amirum. Circular economy. Yeah. He discussed about circular economy and Islamic finance. Regarding the circular economy, according to the speaker, yeah. an economic system that's based on business model, which replace the end of life concept with reducing alternatively reusing, recycling, and recovering yeah, material in production or distribution and consumption processes, thus operating at the micro level. Yeah, and macro level with the aim to accomplish sustainable development, which implies creating environmental quality, economic prosperity, and social equity to the benefit of current and future generation. Yeah. The other note here, yeah, the notion of circular economy is not new. The gagasan economy circular ini bukan sesuatu yang baru, menurut Profesor Amirul. In dalam konteks keuangan Islam, tapi but the application is I think we need to elaborate further. Ya. Di dalam konteks ke keuangan Islam. Circular economy ini bukan sesuatu yang baru. It's not new from the context of Islamic uh, finance, but the application we need to explore more. Yeah. It is the challenge for scholar around the world, yeah. Islamic scholar around the world to so explore more, yeah, regarding the application of circular economy from the perspective of Islamic finance. Then, sector participants and stakeholders must strategically institutionalize circular economy activities in the industry and community. Jadi masyarakat ya, atau para stakeholders ya, harus melembagakan secara strategis. Jadi kita harus membuat menginstitusionalisasi. Ya, dalam bentuk kebijakan kalau pemerintah, kalau corporate dalam polisi bisnisnya masyarakat tentu dalam behavior mereka dalam mensupport terwujudnya circular economy. Ya, kan? ya sehingga ini dalam realitas secara empiris akan bisa apa well implemented as soon as possible. Yeah. Next uh, note is the most recent development indicate that Islamic finance 
is working with the global community to achieve the SDGs and embrace the secular economic concept. Jadi perkembangan paling mutakhir, paling terbaru gitu ya, menunjukkan bahwa keuangan Islam, Islamic finance, sedang bekerja. Artinya seperti perbankan, itu sedang mensupport ya. Bagaimana untuk mewujudkan circular economy? Karena bank ini uh, the rule of the bank is very important, ya, yeah, because the bank uh, will give the a lot of finance to the activities of corporate. Nah, now according to the Professor Amirul, uh, the system is now operate with the stakeholders of the bank to implement this concept. Okay, itu perkembangan terakhir. It is the notes from Professor Amirul. Yeah. Uh, thanks again for your presentation. For very good and for enrichment presentation. Uh, I think now, as I have said, we will continue to the third uh, speaker, Dr. Alex. Yeah. I is yours. I think I give you around 20 minutes. Yeah, time to present your speech. Okay. Welcome. Thank you for the for the opportunity has given to me. The first, I would like to praise the God for the grace to us. So in this morning, we can gather together with a God condition and healthy to participate in this event. I would like also to say my greeting to all audience and all committee speaker in this webinar. Let me present my article with it. Preliminary. The new paradigm of develop, development according to Rustiari et al. 2009 should be directed towards equity, growth, and sustainability. Development is very important to do to support the achievement of the goal they have been set Apria et al. 2014. Argued that development is a process of change to, to achieve the level of welfare of society. People with goodwill in carrying out development. According to the Damkuri uh, 2010, the development is a transformation process that over time is marked by structural, structural change. Solekan 2014, their development of rural areas is a combination of inter-village development in one district, which included the us and utilization of of village areas in the context of determining development areas following district or city special planning service carry out to improve the welfare of rural com community development infrastructure improvement of rural economy and development of appropriate technology the implementation of such a village development Strategy has broke significant change, especially in the physical and social mobility of Villagas, Korea 2015. At Mozo et al. 2017, explained the village development has a very important and strategic role in the context of national development and regional development. The formulation of the problem in the study is how the pillar of sustainable rural development in terms of the level of the rural economy, the level of rural education, the level of rural health, the level of rural infrastructure, and the level of rural technology. The objective of the, this study are to analyze and assess the level of the rural economy, the level of rural education, the level of rural health, the level of rural infrastructure, and the level of rural technology.
literature review, theoretical basis, rural economy level. Development of economic and finance or in depth, a uneven economy growth was caused by several factors such as inequality of infrastructure development, inequality of human research quality, inequality of centralized energy source at Mose et al. 2017. Next, rural education level. Education cannot be used as a cause or even a result of development because education is product of society. While in, in certain circumstances, it is also a means that can be applied to change the social order. The education system in developing countries aims to meet the need to prepare middle level employees and a China workforce. Rural health level. Afforded to determine the level of public health can be seen from several indicators. The indicator co consists of two main aspects, namely mortality and morbidity. Pramud Pramudiani et al. 2019 formulate the people who are cap capable in the health sector can take the right decision and action regarding the health of themselves and their families. The potential included non-governmental organization or NGO and community leader, Health Crisis Management Center 2015. And next, rural infrastructure level. According to Fox 2004, two services derived from the set of public work are traditionally supported by the public sector to exchange private sector production and to allow for household consumption. The result of Anwar and Sujai 2020 research showed the internet connection is rural areas have entered the village digitalization era. Research methodology. This research used a descriptive qualitative research method. The researcher tries to reveal the state of the research object at the time the receipt take place based on the fact from Sugiona to 2000, 2016. Result and discussion, rural economy level. The economy is an important thing that support the growth and development of a region from a traditional economy to a commercial and modern economy. This indicates that the population continue to move into economic actors who continue to create and engage in new economic sector that will have a significant impact on their economy life. Carmela 2018 explained that, ec that economic activity is a very important thing that support the development and progress of a region. Likewise, Kota Baru Village continues to show the development of economic activity from year to year. Ansari Reset 2017 showed the best online number 6 of 2014, Article 77, concerning the village. The rule of village official in the processing village property is to improve the standard of living, welfare, and income of the village community. Sitorus and Firdaus 2013 explained that as, they, that as a growing and developing region, the development of Garut Regency still faced many obstacles because information about the development of each sub region is still limited. The government focus on improving basic human capability so that they can participate in all areas of development. Handayani 2000. 50. Rural health level. Health condition will make a person able to achieve a high quality of life. Otherwise, the illness will reduce a person's quality of life. Then they got at all 2005. The result of Maharani research at all 2018 showed that the Sasyagra is one of the government effort to achieve the vision and mission of a health Indonesia, 
which essentially empowers people to be willing and able to live a healthy life. The result of Sukender Research 2019 show the current community wealth according to UNDP is measured by the human. rural infrastructure level. Infrastructure in general include public facilities prepared by the central and local government as public servant, or as a result of the market mechanism not working to support and encourage the economy and social activity of the community. And next rural technology level. History proves the technological evolution always occur as a result of the hard effort of geniuses, which in turn the technological finding are applied to obtain convenience in life activity and food benefit from it. The result of this study indicate that after condu conducting analysis and comparison of two different environments, it can be concluded that the factor that causes difference in the understanding of children in the in underdeveloped village and urban areas are as follows. There is introduction to information technology learning, or both as a subject as well as in the alternative. And second, un unavailability of information, technology facilities, and infrastructure both at school and in their home environment. And the next, economy factor grid affect children level of understanding of information technology. The result of research by Solisti Wati and Dibu Dibu Orin, 2013, explained the village information system is a serious old system that aims to manage community research. Besides, it is application that help village government in the documenting various village owned data. The conclusion, based on the background, description, and analysis, the data research concluded that, one, the level of the rural economy can be driven by the modern economic system, labor capacity industry, village original income, village business entities, and development priorities and selection. And second, the level of rural education can be boosted by funding for the education sector, infrastructure, and socio-economic condition. And the third, the level of rural health can be driven by the environment, behavior, knowledge, health facilities, medical personnel, health funds, and health program. Four, the level of rural infrastructure can be encouraged by physical development, facility and infrastructure, and community empowerment. And the last, the level of rural technology can be driven by information system, information technology, facilities, and the internet and website. Thank you for the time. This is a reference for the article. The next is the also reference. Thank you for the time and good good morning for all of you. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, thank you yeah, for Dr. Alexander yeah, for your very Good presentation. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's give once again here yeah, a big round of applause for Dr. Alexander. Okay. Before continue, yeah, continue to the next uh, speech, uh, next speaker. Yeah, I would like to make. And not yet for the presentation of Dr. Alexander. 
Uh, first note is the level of rural economy can be driven by the modern economic system, labor capacity, industry, income, village business and titles, and development priorities and section. The his topics eh? Uh, thought about the pillar of the sustainable regional technology development. The second note is the level of rural education can be boosted. Yeah, can be boosted by funding for the education sector, infrastructure, and socio-economic condition. Jadi tingkat dari pendidikan di Pedesaan itu dapat ditingkatkan melalui pendanaan pada sektor pendidikan, infrastruktur, dan kondisi ekonomi. Jadi harus ada komitmen dari pemerintah ya, to strong yes, ya, to, to strengthen, to strengthen the pillar of the system economic development. Then government need to to fund more. Yeah, to the sector, yeah, education, infrastructure, yeah, and economic condition. Okay. The third note is the level of rural health can be driven by the environment, behavior, knowledge, health facilities, medical personnel, health funds, and health programs. Jadi, it tingkat kesehatan pedesaan itu dapat digerakkan melalui yeah, fasilitas lingkungan, perilaku, pengetahuan, kesehatan, yeah, dana untuk uh, dan program kesehatan itu. So itu it is very important to implement atau to strengthen the pillar of sustainable economic development in the region. The fourth note is the level of rural infrastructure can be encouraged by physical development, facilities, and infrastructure, and community empowerment. Tingkat infrastruktur pedesaan dapat didorong melalui pembangunan fisik, fasilitas, infrastruktur, dan pemberdayaan masyarakat. So, don't forget to so empower the village society yeah, to improve the welfare of uh, the prosperity of society. Then, the five knots is the level of rural technology can be driven by information systems information technology facilities, and the internet and websites. Tingkat dari teknologi di pedesaan, di daerah rural, ya, dapat digerakkan melalui sistem informasi. Ya. Seperti, ya, I think it is in general, ya. it is very important. Ya. Information technology facilities, memperkuat fasilitas dari teknologi informasi, dan juga internet dan website. So I think the sharing of information will uh, will be more quick. Yeah. Will, will will be quicker. Yeah. Uh, using uh, IT technology. It is uh, the note of presentation from Dr. Alexander from Timor Leste. Yeah. Uh, once again, thank for Dr. Alex. Now we continue to the last speaker. Yeah. Professor Dr. Brahmasari. He is the former of rector of UNTAC, Surabaya, yeah. Long, long time ago, yeah. Uh, Prof. Brahmasari will present his speech, his paper, 
entitled uh, artificial. artificial intelligence. Although Professor Sari is expert in human resource yeah, management, he will discuss about the development of uh, artificial intelligence from the perspective of cultural aspect. Yeah. How we strengthen artificial intelligence relating to cultural context. I think Professor Sari will be will present about this topic. Okay, we will come to Professor Prahmasari to present your speech. Yeah. Uh, time for you to present your paper is around 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Please, Prof. Prahmasari. Floor is yours. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Ida Ibrahimasari. Very pleased to participate in ICOMA 2022 International Conference on Economics, Management, and Accounting, held by Faculty of Business and Economics, Universitas 17 Agustus 1945, Surabaya. Today, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence. Okay. Artificial intelligence. Since the development of digital computers in the 1940s, it has been proven that computers can be programmed to perform very complex tasks. The modern era, with artificial intelligence or AI technology, Computers can be diverse tasks like humans. A discussion on artificial intelligence is always interesting to find. The term of artificial intelligence was discovered by John McCarthy in 1950. McCarthy mentioned that every aspect of learning or other intelligence features, in principle, can be described very well as machines can be made to stimulate it. A number of efforts have been done to find ways to produce machines using language, abstraction of form, and concept. Solve the types of problems that now we serve for men and improve themselves. Machine learning is a subset of AI that is more narrowly focused on how computer programs interpret data and learn. Instead of relying on a person to put a program, to complete the task, machine learning can recognize patterns and the prediction that can inform the AI. For example, I mean, a machine learning system can catalog employee behaviors to evaluate whether they may be departing for immediate opportunity. AI encompasses all of the ways computer programs can make in intelligence decisions, while ML focuses on how AI collects and uses data that is not explicitly programmed by a person. The utilization of AI that has been implemented in Indonesia. In the field of education, the development of AI technology in Indonesia, especially in the field of education, has been widely implemented by schools and higher education and universities in Indonesia. Zenius is an Indonesian one of Indonesian online learning platform that has been using AI technologies on Zen 4. In the field of health, the AI ability to process and analyze data faster can make it easier to handle the spread of COVID-19 virus. As AI has the data analysis method named machine learning that can create analytic, analytics automatically. A technology developed by Netflix and face mask that's an alert, alert can monitor community activities in more detail. Not loops applies AI technology to monitor using face detection. The wow. of security, AI can detect malware and all cyber attacks. 
with the use of an identity agency that gives you cyber and state good issues, this is the assessment, become more effective and efficient. The examples of artificial intelligence and machine learning in practice. Snapdrag. Snapdrag is an Indonesian startup founded in uh, 2015 to create a gift app that's back to buyers only by scanning receipt. This activity enabled com another company called Purchase Data in the last quantity of the last company, Success Unilever, Johnson & Johnson, Nestle, and PNG. The data can be used to find out retail price movements, market share, of a product or a brand and pricing performance so that the company can win the competition. Snapchat also operating in, in, the, in Singapore, the Philippines, and Brazil. Mm -hmm. Second one is Kata.ai. It is a start, startup founded in 2015 that builds number one AI conversation platform in Indonesia. Initially, Kata AI just focus on developing chatbots. It is now provide integrated conversational AI equipped with chatbox features, with integrated with customer service, conversation management, marketing campaigns, and virtual assistance development enterprise for AD or audio based. Kata AI partners has reached more than 100 enterprises, SMEs, business. Starts up and corporation. DJ Tech. Founded in 2015, DJ Tech facilitates communication between seller and buyer. It develops user friendly platform that creates a chat box for business purposes. DJ Tech's wow. first product was Future Friends and Banking Smart Apps. With this application, the seller doesn't have to reply to various chat. Digitex provides a mini website service that can be used by sellers to display their products. Digitex clients include Skype Panel, Uber, and so on. Sona. Sona is a startup founded by Amin Krishna. It is a foster parent of Telecom Indonesia to the program named Indigo Creative Nation Today. It is very successful and popular. Sona clients include big companies that need digital media monitoring service. The service will make its company clients easier to manage business, monitoring social media, and measuring consumer sentiment. Netflix. Netflix founded in 2016. Netflix is a moving company in the field of TV analytics and AI. The company that uses deep learning and machine learning methods supported by Telcom Indonesia. Netflix funding from this venture. Netflix partnered with NVIDIA, which offers video analytics service to monitor CCTV cameras. They provide face integrated interception service with data, population, blood monitoring, people number, fluid reading, and garbage detection. Project. It is an app that implements AI from Google to good recommendations to sync project drivers to complete consumer orders, determine pickup points, determine price spike to meet demand supply criteria, and so on. Applying the latest AI technology. These are a number of uh, companies that use AI. And I'm sure there's some, some more. Okay, Alibaba. Alibaba is a Chinese very use, a successful e-commerce platform using AI every day to predict what customer might want to buy. Using AI to automate the product description using natural language generation. Alibaba also venturing out offering AI to farmers. 
Alibaba also has a project called the Alibaba City Brain, offering AI to cities to create smart cities across China and across the world. Alphabet. Alphabet is a Google's parent company. We have the Waymo company, which offers self-driving taxi services in California. They're driving your passengers every single day across certain parts of California. Oh. Keep mind. It's a company that has developed an algorithm to play the ancient board game go. Google Duplex, a voice interface, a voice assistant that can now make phone calls, book restaurants, hairdressing appointments for you and the other person online who don't even know that this, this is not a real person who is speaking to. Amazon. Amazon is a company that really thrives on AI. Amazon uses AI for a lot of things, including anticipatory seeking. Amazon is getting so confident about understanding a customer as an individual and what customer is going to buy, that they are starting to shift things towards customer before customer even made the decision to buy it. Amazon.com. Sorry, Amazon Go. There are physical reasons where customers go shopping, but they don't have to check out the book. Everything is done using the ancient vision. Camera will watch and scan customer when she, he or she walk into the store. Camera will watch the customers put in his or her bag, I'm sorry, his or her shopping basket, and then customer walk out and it will trust you. Baidu. Baidu is a Chinese search, and search uh, engine company. A Chinese, it is a Chinese Google equivalent. They are using AI to clone your voice. They only need a slip of it, like in two and a half seconds of somebody's voice, and they can now clone this. Release, uh, Baidu also released a tool that would speak to you. You would hear uh, the author's voice reading the book to you. And this is all automated. Facebook. Facebook is a company that has invested hugely into AI and machine learning. Facebook feedbacks a tool that a tool that allows them to automatically understand not only what you are saying in your Facebook post, but also sentiment and the meanings behind what you are saying. Facebook also invested in deep face, a technology that allows Facebook to recognize your face anywhere on the internet. Once you have been packed or uploaded photographs, it can then create a 3D image of your face and see where else do you appear to make new friends suggestion. IBM. IBM has a very long track record of using AI. They used to defeat Gary Kasparov in chess and both this man versus machine competitions. IBM, the project debater, the cognitive computing engines against two human professional debaters. Everyone was given a number of topics and they had to do the research. They come up with their arguments and convince them in a live audience. The audience would vote which one convinced them the most. A cognitive computing engine can now do research by itself, which come up with the right arguments and actually present this to a large audience. A JD.com, it is a Chinese e-commerce giant. Richard Liu, the founders, hoped that his company would be 100% automated in the future. They have warehouses with no one working on it completely automating things using it. They use drone deliveries for the last four or couple of years. Microsoft. As you know, Microsoft is a company that focuses usually on AI, not only as a company that offers AI service to many of their clients, 
but also the AI as the future of software. Microsoft Office tools have added a number of capabilities in it, from spell checkers to understanding how you use the tools and making recommendations. Tencent, it is a Chinese social media company which creates WeChat. They understand this amount of information and insights about it, their customers, and they have also started to integrate this with other things like pay processor, so you can use WhatsApp, pay to pay, pay to medical bills, for example. Now I'm going to talk about the integration of AI into human resources process. This R relies on new platform and technologies to stay up with the rapidly evolving workplace. AI with its capacity for analysis, diagnosis, diagnosis and prediction progressively becoming more common in its operation. AI for its art is not a new concept, sorry. As technology, as technology matures, it is increasingly, increasingly a standard feature of tools and applications. AI can speed up decision making, streamline the procedures, and raise, it, and raise a few concerns. The automation of essential tasks is one of AI's most immediately apparent advantages in the workplace. Computers employ data to stimulate human learning and analysis, which lessen your workload and increases productivity. In artificial intelligence as the future of its own. Some of the areas that AI can provide within AI operations are streamlining hiring and removing biases and recruitment. Second, simplifying its function. Third one, improving coding processes. And the fourth one, developing a more useful training strategy. However, limit, uh, AI has limitations as AI still requires human programming. There's room for potential errors and biases. If AI are used frequently to replace regular human interaction, the technology can also start to make a work environment through systems and automated. If a company doesn't keep its concern in mind, it is it is making hiring and HR processes less useful and more painful for current and potential employees. Of course, it will hurt employees' satisfaction and a company's retention rates. It might be higher. AI is not just helpful, it is also causes new issues within a company and its people. AI is, an, is not a replacement for actual human improvement. There are cases where AI is detriment to you and your companies, to, your, to you, your companies, and your employees. Oops. Wait a moment. The cost of the R in HR. Among other things are introducing machine generated oh, errors. Yeah. Computers yeah. are not always the right choice for doing analysis. Errors yeah, in the programming can be start in misinterpretation of data or taking into account the wrong factors when sorting through candidates. Cool. AI, okay. AI is a perpetuating biases and hiring. Using AI to sort through candidates can unintentionally create biases and eliminate qualified diverse candidates. If the initial parameters we set up in the program include implicit implicit bias, it will come true in the result we get. The third one is some decision require human human involvement. While AI is trained for analyzing data and presenting useful conclusion for decision making, AI cannot always pick up on important non-technical nuances. And the last one is AI can increase risk to cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. 
chat box can be with vehicles for streamlining within its eye transaction. However, they are also easy target for hackers. Sharing sensitive personal or company data to these apps could lead you to open to cyber attacks or identify that. How AI impact the future? AI going to open the chapter for the society of the world that people try to understand that ourselves better than the other. That's a statement from Rob Jekma. AI is going to deliver so many improvements in quality of our life. It's from Mark Zuckerberg, father and CEO of Facebook. We are now solving problems with machine learning and AI that were kind, kind of in the realm of science fiction for the last several decades. So Jeff Bezos is as founder and CEO of Amazon. AI is probably the most important thing you need to get has ever worked on it now. AI is something more profound than electricity or fire. Anytime you work with technology, you need to learn to harness the benefits while minimizing the downsides. That's Sundar Pichai, CEO of Google. AI is definitely the future of the world. It will drive the economy of tomorrow. Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft, mentioned that Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft are moving ahead and have a great speed in improving uh -huh. AI software. The software will solve that where it will look at all new information and present to you knowing about your interests will be the most valuable and making us more efficient. Apple, the Tim Cook as the CEO of Apple, focus on automation system. Apple see it as the mother of all AI projects. Autonomy is something that's incredibly exciting for us. AI also different from stuff. Things which are constrained and look like a zero sum thing today. It may not be so in the future. It could again, again, AI is definitely the future of the world. I will drive it for tomorrow. It is difficult to educate people in a cost effective way. AI fundamentally changed the equation. It may make it possible for us to have clean and cheap renewable energy for the future. A lot of things. We play out in more positive ways than people think, said Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google. By internet, your self driving will be encompassed essentially almost driving, at least 100% to 200% safer than a person. Integration of AI into human resources process. A number of researchers found that 50% of workers are currently using some form of AI at work compared to only 32% in 2018. The majority, the majority, 60% of workers are optimistic, excited, and grateful about having robot co-workers, and nearly a quarter report having a loving and gratifying relationship with AI at work. Workers in India, 60%, China, 56%, are the most excited about the app, followed by the U UAE, 44%, Singapore, 41%, Brazil, 30%, Australia, New Zealand, 26%, Japan, 25%, US, 23%, UK, 20%, and back France, 8%. And I'm, I believe uh, the percentage uh, is higher now. Men have more positive view of AI at work than women, with 30% men optimists, optimistic versus 23% of women, according to uh, Tony Castro. Workers have become more optimistic as they've adapted to AI in the workplace, and HR 
is leading the way over the past three years. A study conducted in 2019 showed that AI is redefining not only the relationship between workers and managers, but also the role of a manager in an AI driving force. John Scobert. Some examples are how companies are invested in the AI and cognitive computing for the HR workflows. Candidate resume on smart digital form. HR is all about connecting companies with current and prospective employees on a personal level. For this to be achieved on a large scale, its other departments need to be leveraging scalable AI technology. Mm -hmm. As companies make the candidate experience a priority for the recruiting operation, many have invested in AI to help them analyze a candidate's previous work experience and interest and match them with open rules best suit for them. Understanding employee reforms. AI is also involved in enabling is our teams to better understand employee referral by looking into the kinds of candidates employees are referring and gaining insight on who refers the most successful ones to go back that way. Data back resources and insights. All this is our profession. AI gives its our professional data back, data back resources and insight gather directly from employees. This then allows HR professionals to take action and deliver the employee experience the workplace wants and asks for, which as a result boosts engagement and love low, lowers turnover. Michael Cohen. AI back chatbots keep engagement composition going. Employee engagement is also a science, and a part of that science is measuring and analyzing employee sentiment on a day to day basis. Chatbots can provide a natural, human like, and always on communication tool that engages the user in personalized conversation. Boosting learning and development programs. The future of learning and development departments development department using AI will increase tremendously over the next couple of years. These department, departments will be expected to create agile and adaptable learning programs that are unable to meet the individual needs of employees. At the same time, they will use data and analytics in a deeper way to show impact back to the business. Elizabeth Green. Leveraging transactional workforce data. Its actions can use AI to leverage transactional workforce data to predict employee potential, fatigue, flight risk, and even overall engagement, ultimately enabling more productive composition to improve the employee experience, retention, and performance. It is now possible to leverage AI to build smarter, personalized schedules and to leverage AI to review time off and shift up swap requests in a real time based on predetermined business rule. Jason Daba. Powering workforce analytics. AI and in HR, in HR empowers managers to solve problems and can lead to more informed decisions that affect employees and organizational success. Using real time analytics, for example, shows managers to impact their absence, absences, open swifts, and unplanned schedule changes will have on key performance indicators, allowing them to make more informed decisions that avoid issues before they arise. Based on Sabbath. AI vector plots. Keep management composition doing. Employee engagement is also a sign. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I have read that. Okay. 
Okay. Now, come to the conclusion that the latest advancements in machine learning and artificial intelligence are rapidly, are rapidly reaching mainstream. The relationship between humans and machines is being redefined at work. There is no one size fits all approach to successfully managing these things. Instead, organizations need to partner with their HR organization to personalize an approach to implementing AI at work in order to meet the changing expectation of their teams around the world. Let's conclude, let's conclude and complete my presentation today. I hope um, you enjoy my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the for the yeah, yeah. thank you yeah for Doctor Brasari for your yeah, very good speech yeah. Uh, please give applause yeah for Professor Brahmasari yeah. Okay. Okay, now ladies and gentlemen, uh, before coming to ENA session, I would like to give a note yeah, from the speed of Professor Brahmasari. Yeah. There are three notes I would like to present. First, the latest advancements in machine learning and artificial intelligence are rapidly reaching mainstream. Jadi kemajuan terbaru dalam machine learning dan AI, artificial intelligence adalah mencapai dengan cepat what we want to connect, yeah. then straight away it will reach us into the uh, the latest advancement yeah, of AI. The second note, yeah, the relationship between humans and machine is being redefined, yeah, redefined at work. Hubungan antara manusia dan machine adalah sedang dipahami ulang di tempat bekerja. Jadi the connection between human and and machine sekarang ini lagi intent didefinisikan ulang di berbagai korporasi. Ya, yeah. to maybe to to get in your insight. Ya, yeah. how corporate use AI. Yeah. In the in the company. The, the third note is there is no one size fits all approach to successfully managing this change. Tidak ada satu pendekatan tunggal yang sesuai gitu. Jadi banyak uh, ragam dari a lot of kind ya, approach. Jadi ada pendekatan tunggal. Bagi mengelola perubahan yang berhasil, still trial and error ya. Yeah. So we need to elaborate a lot of possibilities ya. Yeah. To find with one is the best ya, yeah. or with one is the most, uh, the most apa, the most suitable ya. Yeah. The three not ya yeah, atau the third not ya. Yeah. Uh, then ya. Yeah. Sebagai gantinya, ya instead, ya organisasi, ya organisasi need to partner with their human relation organization to personalize the approach to implementing AI, ya, artificial intelligence at work in other to, ya, in other to meet the changing expectations of their teams around the world. 
sebagai gantinya karena tidak ada pendekatan tunggal maka sebagai gantinya ya, instead perusahaan atau organisasi butuh ya untuk bermitra ya bermitra atau menggandeng berkolaborasi dengan organisasi organisasi human relationship ya organisasi SDN organisasi yang komit dengan human capital development ya, untuk mempersonalkan atau untuk menyesuaikan to personalize the approach ya untuk mempersonalkan pendekatan itu ya dalam rangka bagaimana mengimplementasikan mewujudkan AI itu artificial intelligence agar supaya bisa memenuhi harapan-harapan yang sedang berubah, yang sedang berkembang ya dari tim mereka di seluruh dunia. Jadi solusinya adalah kan tidak ada tunggal, maka perusahaan perlu menggandeng berkolaborasi bermitra dengan organisasi human capital ya untuk bisa mendesain ya sistemnya itu yang based on AI ya agar bisa bisa match dengan harapan mereka dari tim mereka di berbagai belahan dunia jadi harus bermitra kompas kita dengan tim ya itu it is the note from uh, the presentation of professor Brahmasar oke okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. again, thanks uh, for yeah, thanks very much for all presenters and for all speakers for their informative and interesting talk. Yeah. Very well, ladies and gentlemen. Now. We come to question and answer session. Yeah. Kita tiba pada sesi pertanyaan. Yeah. Q&A. There will be two sessions. Yeah. Akan ada dua sesi. Yeah. And each session is for three questions. Jadi untuk tiap sesi itu ada tiga pertanyaan. Please mention your name and state to which presenter you address your question. Yeah, the, when you give question, then you mention to whom you will ask. Yeah, okay, please. For first session, I give three audience to ask a question. Yeah. Okay, Mister Doctor Sihab. Okay, Muhammad Hafi. Yeah, okay, candidate <laughs> doctor. Yeah, Muhammad Hafi. Yes. Uh, I want to question to okay. Mr. Dr. Marlon. Yeah. Mr. 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 Dr. Marlon. Yes, sir. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. Uh, uh, nice to meet you, Mr. Marlon. Uh, Uh, I see the your presentation on economy and artificial intelligence to sustainable growth. Uh, I want uh, the sustainable growth, Mr. Marlon. Uh, uh, is there any relationship uh, about your presentation uh, sustainable growth with uh, uh, Michael Porter theory? Uh, you know, Michael Porter theory, one of books, uh, advantage. Uh, how to create the uh, economic superior performance? Okay. Uh, especially about uh, strategy uh, with uh, Michael Porter. Michael Porter theory says uh, strategy about creation of an unique and playable position. A strategy is requires to make threat of incompetent to choose not what to do. Strategy is creating a fit uh, among uh, activity, uh, company activities. 
you know. The biggest mistake of strategy is to think that uh, that uh, to, that to, there's only one way to compete. Every industry there is have um, there is a have different ways to compete. So there is no uh, there is there there is no uh, there is no the best way to compete. Uh, okay. If you doing same, if you doing same thing with your, your cost, you with your competitor, uh, it's mean you you have not strategy. If you have a uh, valuable uh, 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 value proposition with your competitor, you have not strategy. If you have value proposition, the same as uh, your competitor, uh, it's mean have not strategy. Uh, you only doing better and better. If you doing better and better, it's called uh, operational excellence. It's no strategic. Okay. The fundamental of strategy is uh, choices. Uh, Strategy is around the choices, what the choices you make versus what the choices that your competitor are making. Okay. Ito pilihi, may na may nan yun naman ay halak din bawa pilihi. Oh, the biggest, the biggest mistake of strategy. Question, please, Pak Muhammad Hafi, would you yes. please direct to the question, please? Oh yes, I this uh, my question. The essence of strategy is to find unique position. Uh, that deliver unique value to customer that to uh, that to try to sell. It's my question. Uh, is there any relation uh, about your presentation sustainable growth with uh, uh, <coughs> Michael Porter theory? Uh, thank you, oh. <coughs> Mr. Dr. Malon. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for the question. If you if you notice the. Uh, thank you very much for the question. If you notice, my presentation is about um, um, how would probably uh, how, how how the educational sector can actually contribute to uh, or probably transition into uh, contributing to a green economy. I understand that educational institutions are also a business enterprise because school usually do not exist simply to deliver or to provide uh, services or uh, education. Uh, uh, schools also need to uh, uh, also need to earn money to pay off uh, for the expenses. So if you look at the competitive advantage based on borders strategy, as you have noticed, things have changed so much since uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, became a pandemic. So if you're looking at a strategic uh, competitive strategy, and if you're looking at another university as your competitor, so you also have to strategize. You have to change the way you do, you manage uh, probably our course offerings. We will make it more flexible. We will invest more in technology. We'll invest more in upscaling and upgrading both our academic personnel and non-academic personnel because we will no longer go back to pre-pandemic scenario in which everything will be the same. Whether we like it or not, uh, COVID-19 has changed the landscape of business, and that includes educational institutions. So if you are looking at the education as a, a business enterprise, more than just a service-oriented uh, enterprise, so we have to come up with a better strategy, flexibility in our course offerings, flexibility in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in providing uh, academic services, uh, investing more in technology. Because the reality is most of the schools, <clears throat> although we teach students about, you know, the, uh, the importance of embracing technology, but the reality, this is real talk. Most of us are not even that familiar with technology. We are actually forced to learn technology because if we do not learn technology and because of the pandemic, we will not be able to uh, survive. Thank you very much, sir. I hope it answered your question. 
another question can i <coughs> okay thank you yeah for the answer of dr marion yeah i think i will give one more question yeah because Me, please. i am limited okay okay me please sir please. Oh, i have a question please and then and then one again please and okay. then one from the a45 okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Muhammad. My question is for Dr. Marlon from Thailand. For the first, I would like to thank you for Dr. Marlon that always concerned about EWAS problem. So that we become, we always remember and reminder to save our planet, of course, and save her and care about the next generation future. Uh, I have a viral news, uh, updated news in my district in Kabupaten Banyuwangi, especially. This is located in east of Java. Maybe you know uh, this is beside of Bali Island. Uh, the problem about waste of rapid antigen injection and all of waste is just thrown away to the sea. So make us very worried and very sorrow. So we know that the fish is always become favorite food, especially uh, grilled fish. We know that we uh, we worried about what it every what? day. Nah. And then, hello. <laughs> and then our question is for Mr. Marlon. How about government role to manage this it was problem. So as long as we know, I think it's impossible if you become a single fighter, of course, to education and environment and society. I think it's enough. Maybe my question. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam, for the question. Yes. Um... Actually, uh, this is really the sad reality. Uh -huh. if you look Your speaker is not working. Uh, okay, so um, this is really the sad reality because for most of us, I don't know, I might be wrong. We usually, uh, we usually just um, rely on government intervention. But the reality is, like for example, uh, 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 the... APK antigen waste, these are what we can probably we can consider as a medical waste. This is not just going to be um, government concern because if you notice, antigen kits now can be purchased in, like here in Thailand, you can purchase an APK antigen kit from 7 Eleven. So it's really very um, easy to acquire all these things. and But we do not know how to dispose this particular um, uh, waste. So my, my, my approach to this is really multi-sectoral because if, if, if we rely on the government, the government now is actually overworked. Overworked um, as far as um, uh, containing the, the pandemic uh, for, for, the, for the last two to three years. So I think civil society, government organizations or, or grassroots organization and even organizations like schools, we should be able to provide free antigen tests so that um, instead of asking our all employee, individual employees, oh, you buy your own antigen test and you do your own testing and all these things. Uh, so we can manage the waste. We can coordinate with the proper government authorities who will uh, pick the waste, pick up the waste from, 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 from us. So uh, there are also several organizations, for example, like Greenpeace or NGO or non, uh, non government organization who will help us out with that. From our end, as educational institution, I think uh, we should also be able to provide the right information uh, to our students or even to the community. It's about time we have to go out of the community and engage, uh, engage um, educational, informational, and educational uh, activities 
uh, to help them educate on how to properly dispose this kind of waste. Because this is not just ordinary waste. This is what we can probably consider as, as medical waste. And any form of waste, especially medical waste, could be, could be harmful. So that is my approach, multi-sectoral, and it should involve everybody, the civil society, government, non-government organizations, and even at the grassroots organizations. Like, for example, if you if, if you have uh, if you uh, if you uh, uh, live in one place, there are in my back in my country. If you are if, if you belong to one one and place, there is like an or uh, an, a set of officers there who will coordinate with the rest of the residents on how to properly. How, how to properly dispose this kind of wastes. Thank you, ma'am. I hope I answer your question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, finally, we come to the end of presentation. The time is limited, yeah? <laughs> For this, yeah? We would like to say thanks again for all the speakers for the informative and interesting talk and to audience for your active participation. Hopefully the presentation will be beneficial for everybody to enlighten, yeah, to enrich our few. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Good day. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Now time is Bu Dr. Holes Hidayati ya. Oke, okay, thank you very much Pak Muhammad Sihab. Waalaikumsalam. Oke, okay, unfortunately time is up because it is Friday uh, and we just have short time. Ladies and gentlemen, we finally come to the end of the first agenda. Let us close to this seminar by reciting Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. It seems that there is a high interrelationship among all the topics. I'm sure this seminar is very interesting yeah. and it is useful for us as the reference for our dissertation work. Especially for all the speakers, thank you very much for spending your time to be with us. Thank you for taking time off your busy schedule. Thank you for sharing the knowledge. Nice to meet you. See you next time. Stay healthy and safe. Nice and warm greeting for your family. Dr. Amiru, thank you. Dr. Amiru, Dr. Marlon, Dr. Alex, Dr. Sihab, and all the participants for the Zoom and meeting. Okay. Those are the ideas we have presented to you all this morning. We hope you learned something. Thank you so much for your attention. See you on the next occasion. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the Thank knowledge. you everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Marla. See you. Oh, terima kasih banyak. Assalamualaikum. Terima kasih. About two hours breaking time. Dr. Kolis. So enjoy your breaking time. See you. Dr. Semiati. After. Dr. Afi, after the yeah, okay. up. Oh, you we will start again at 13. Terima kasih semuanya. Ya. Terima kasih. Jangan lupa nanti ada seminar nasional loh ya. Siap Jadwalnya kan besok Mbak MN seminar nasional loh wajib hadir. Ya prof. Ya prof. Ya prof. Pak Yanto diinfokan teman-temannya.
Ya, Bu. Terima kasih, Pak. Semangat, Pak Yanto. Siap, Pak Yanto. Nobody wants to go home. Terima kasih, Pak. Selamat, Pak Doktor. Kunkap. Pak Arifin. Oke. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Banyak aman aman. Aman aman. Pak Yanto. Ini Aman. Aman Pak. Alhamdulillah. Pak Zai. Aman enggak? Ya, selamat siang semuanya, Pak. Selamat siang. Selamat siang, Pak. Pak, 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 Halo. Mau? Bisa. Fokus los nih. Eh, how to cure los, urkan la toba. Ahora tú quieres comer ese fali. Así te gustó lo. Hmm. Está ahí te pelea. Oye, ¿ha trabajado con ellos para bupati, sí? Ah. Hmm. Ha estado más de dos horas. De dos horas. ¿Qué pasa? ¿Ha estado ahí? Ah, ha estado ahí. Ha estado ahí. Ok. ¿Para qué se va a presentar? ¿Ha estado ahí? Thank <laughs> you. 